Welcome aboard the Isle of Man Steam Railway for this journey from Douglas to Port Erin. Calling at Port Soderick, Santon, Balasala, Ronaldsway Airport, Castletown, Balabeg, Colby, The Level and Port St. Mary. So, sit back and relax. We're about to set off. On our journey today, we're being pulled by engine number four, Loch. She's the oldest of the working locomotives on the line and was built by Bear, Peacock and Company of Manchester in 1874. Bear Peacock had begun building steam engines for the world's first underground rail system run by the London Metropolitan Railway a decade earlier. Loch is named after Henry Loch, the Isle of Man's Lieutenant Governor at the time. As Scott, he'd served on a diplomatic mission to China with Lord Elgin, where he was imprisoned for three weeks before narrowly escaping death. He served as the island's governor from 1863 until 1882 and went on to become governor of the Australian state of Victoria and Cape Colony in South Africa. As we leave the boundary of Douglas Station and its associated yard, we're quickly into countryside. While we can still see the industrial premises running along Peel Road to our right, on the left are the woods on the edge of the nunnery estate. Today it's home to the International Business School and the Centre for Manx Studies. But the nunnery has an interesting previous occupant. For 20 years, it was home to the racehorse owner and breeder Robert Sangster. Three times married, Sangster famously had an affair with Mick Jagger's girlfriend, Texan model Jerry Hall. Sangster's father had started the Vernon's Pools business in 1926, and Robert sold it nearly 70 years later for £90 million. Ahead is our first bridge on the journey, which carries us over the River Douglas. The track follows a long curve to the left as we begin to head towards the southwest of the island. When we began at Douglas Station, we were about 40 feet above sea level. But between here and Port Soderick, we'll peak at nearly 200 feet, and you'll hear Loch working hard to make the gradient. For some of this section of the track, the Victorian engineers who built it were faced with creating cuttings through the rock. And although they're never very deep, they do restrict the view of the countryside around at times. But once we reach Kerrystal and the sight of the sea, the landscape opens up again. Our trip to Port Erin takes us through some of the most beautiful countryside on the Isle of Man. But when this railway was built, there were strong commercial reasons for it. The line to Port Erin was the second one to be built. It was preceded by the Douglas to Peel line built in 1873. This line we're travelling on was originally meant to terminate at Castletown, but plans were put at hand to build a deep water port at Port Erin and the railway was extended to take advantage of the traffic this would generate. However, the docking facilities were damaged by heavy seas and the idea was quickly abandoned. This 15 and a half mile section of line is the last surviving of the Isle of Man Steam Railway. In addition to the Douglas Peel line, there was also the St. John's to Ramsey line, which ran up the west coast. That was built in 1878 by the Manx Northern Railway, but within five years of opening it was faced with competition from the Manx Electric Railway, which followed the East Coast route, and the company was taken over by the Isle of Man Railway in 1904. The end came in 1975, when the Douglas to Peel and St John's to Ramsey tracks were lifted. But thankfully, the Douglas to Port Erin line remains as a tribute to the work of those fine Victorian engineers.
Engine number four is still steaming hard as it makes the climb. At times as much as one in 65 along this stretch. Ahead is our second bridge, this time over a public road. From Douglas to Port Erin is 15 and a half miles, and our first stop will be at Port Soderick in about eight minutes. Ahead of that is the first summit and our first glimpse of the sea. The weather today couldn't be better for our journey. The Manx say that the god Mananan casts his cloak of mist over the island when strangers approach. But with crystal clear blue skies, he seems to be accepting us as friends today. On this section of the line, there are two cuttings. We've already passed through one, and the other is a short distance up ahead. But you'll see a marked difference between the two. The first was wide, but the work nearly caused the bankruptcy of the contractors. So the second was completed on a much smaller budget, and the rock face the railway carves its way through is only inches away from the carriages. The Isle of Man Railway has had something of a checkered financial history over the years. As we've already heard, the system was originally run by two separate companies, but they merged in 1904. Competition from the Manx Electric Railway, buses, and later from a growing use of cars was always going to challenge the railway, and things eventually came to a head in 1978 when it was taken into government ownership. Today, the steam railway is one of the finest attractions of its kind in the British Isles, drawing tens of thousands of visitors and enthusiasts from around the world to travel back in time. We're running on a narrow gauge of three feet, about two-thirds of the gauge of the world's mainline railways. It provides for a more interesting ride, but it's part of the character of this system. Our locomotive lock was originally built with a small boiler, but in 1909 she was upgraded and the new boiler provided the same power as the later engine, number 10 GH Wood, which also remains in service today. We've now entered the second of the cuttings between Douglas and Port Soderick and we'll see the difference ahead in the approach taken by the line's builders as they try to save money. We slow down for a short distance for line working, but ahead of us is a revelation that's worth waiting for. The abilities of steam engines had advanced by the time Locke was built in 1874, but there still wasn't what you might call an excess of power. Railways were designed to follow the contours of the land, making use of cuttings and, in extreme cases, tunnels to make the gradients as shallow as possible. But despite this, this section of line has a relatively steep gradient of 1 in 65 in places. And in a few minutes, once we've reached our first summit, there's a 1 in 60 descent into Port Soderick Station. We've nearly reached the end of this troublesome section of cutting, and when we do, we'll be getting close to an important point on the line. Back in the open, our camera mounted on top of Loch gives a tantalizing view of the water ahead. Our driver adds more power for the final push to the summit and in a moment the full beauty of the vistas available on our journey will be revealed for the first time. You can hear Locke struggling up the last few feet of the ascent. We climbed from 40 feet above sea level at Douglas to about 200 feet now. But as the track begins to curve right towards our first stop at Port Soderick, we can see it's been worth it. To our left is a magnificent view of the Isle of Man's rugged coastline. 
The road on the left once carried the Douglas Southern Electric Tramway, which ran from Douglas Head along the cliff edge to Port Soderick. This was an immensely popular spot in Victorian times, and the competition for passengers was intense. We've passed the first summit and the hard work is over for the moment. You can hear the speed of the engine pick up as we begin a rapid descent towards the first station. Our driver reduces power and allows gravity to pull us forward. We've a couple of sharp turns to make, first to the right, then to the left, and then we'll be on the station. The driver applies some braking to slow us for the stop ahead, and the fireman replenishes the fire. As we pass under the farm bridge, the track has begun to climb again. Locke's respite was short-lived. But our momentum will take us close to the first stop. We saw Marine Drive a short while back. The spectacular clifftop road provided a popular link between Port Soderick and Douglas. But erosion took its toll on the engineering, and it suffered a number of collapses over the years. Today, a section of it is closed to cars, but you can still admire the view on foot if you feel like a stroll and a breath of sea air. Port Soderick station is now in sight, and the driver applies a little power to take us to the platform. Each of the steam railway stations has its own charm, but this one stands out. It's set on a curve above the road to the beautiful little cove a short walk away, and it's easy to see why the Victorians enjoyed coming here so much. Today, a family is waiting to board for the trip to the south of the island, so there's a short stop to let them join the train before we set off once more. The guard signals the driver to leave, and with a short toot in reply, he adds power to get us moving once again. Port Soderick Station was the scene of one of the most recent accidents on this railway, though it has to be said it was a pretty minor one. In May 2008, the first southbound train of the day was in a collision with a van. It was being pulled by our locomotive today, Loch. The engine sustained some minor damage, but because it was travelling at low speed, the effects of the incident were minimal. None of the 74 passengers and crew was hurt. We'll be climbing again soon with another small summit ahead. We're currently at about 200 feet above sea level, and we'll need to pass the 280-foot mark between here and our next stop at Santon. The parish of Santon is the smallest on the Isle of Man at around 8 square miles. It's named after Saint Sanctane. He was an active missionary in the 6th century in Cumbria before becoming a bishop on the island. There's a strong connection with history in the parish, as there is throughout the Isle of Man. Four promontory forts dating back almost 2,000 years have been excavated, and their remains can be visited along the coastal footpath. On the right-hand side at the moment, we'll see an example of the Mac's fascination with the railways. 
There's a range of rail systems active around the island. The steam railway, electric railway, mountain railway, Graudel Glen railway, to name but a few. But here you can glimpse the Kroger Railway at Kroger House. It's a private miniature railway which runs around the grounds of this beautiful property and its lake. But sadly, it's not open to the public. We're passing through Kroger Woods, an area renowned for its bluebells. The woods are named along with the Kroger River, which rises to the north and forms the boundary of the parish of Santon for part of its length. Ahead is the now disused halt at Balacostain, also known as Rifle Range Halt. It was used by pupils of King William's College in Castletown, but there's little left of it today save for a grassy hump. The valley and the trees restrict our view for a while, but as we re-emerge into the open, we can begin to take in our surroundings once again. The first road bridge we encounter over the railway looks no different from any of the others, but you may notice a small date plaque on its arch, which is important. It shows that it was built in 2001, and that is something of a puzzle on a railway which was constructed back in the 19th century. So why is that particular bridge so modern and why would you need one in the middle of the Manx countryside? We'll get the answer in a moment. Our driver adds more power again as we begin another climb and we hear the sounds so beloved by enthusiasts as the steam from Lox boilers is turned into mechanical energy. So as we pass under another road bridge, let's return to the puzzle of the previous one with the plaque dated 2001. Why was a new bridge needed in the middle of the tranquility of the Manx countryside? Well, the answer is a little unsavory, but it reveals some very clever thinking which solved a problem caused by the expansion of the island's population and at the same time provided for an upgrade of the steam railway's track. The bridge was constructed to give road access to the Isle of Man's new sewage treatment works at Miri Vague. Originally planned to treat all of the island's sewage, it currently processes about two-thirds of it. But the pipework from Port Erin to Miri Vague, a portion of which you can see on the right at this bridge, was laid under the track, and the result was that the line was renewed and upgraded as part of the work. So, as we travel from here to our destination, you might like to bear in mind what we're traveling over. Or then again, you might not. We're just a couple of minutes away from our next stop at Santon now. In a moment, we'll curve around to the right, turning inland. But for now, we're heading southwest, and the sea is visible on the horizon to the left. Loch is picking up speed again, and our route through the countryside is relatively flat between here and Santon. The station is one of a number of request stops along this line, and passengers boarding the train tell the guard if they need to get off at one. Those waiting at the station are told to signal clearly to the driver that they want to get on, and shortly he'll give a long blast on the whistle to warn anyone waiting ahead that we're about to arrive. As we turn back to the northwest, the horizon changes from sea to hills. There are three dominant peaks in the southwest of the island. The smallest is Bradder Hill at 754 feet, two miles north of our destination at Port Erin. To the north of that is Crockney Arila, which is Manx for Hill of the Day Watch, a reference to its use as a lookout post during the time of the Viking invasions. 
It stands at more than 1,400 feet, but is topped by South Barul, a little further north, which peaks at just under 1,600 feet. There are the remains of an ancient fort on its summit, and in local folklore, it's home to the Manx god Mananan. The driver is now preparing to break for Santon Station. The records for Santon show that the railway was used for more than just the carriage of passengers. In 1910, the first siding on the line was built here, along with a cattle pen and a cart road. With the primary use of the siding being for manure traffic, it was a fine precedent for what is carried in the pipeline under the track today. The station comes into sight and we prepare to stop to let passengers off. Many of the stations on the line have double tracks serving separate platforms to allow for trains travelling in opposite directions to pass. Balasala and Castletown are regularly used for this purpose. But it's a rarer sight at stations like Santon and today we have the place to ourselves. As we pull out of Santon, we're getting towards the halfway point on our journey. Our next stop will be at Balasala in about eight minutes. And when we get there, we'll find the service from Port Erin to Douglas waiting on the opposite platform for us to clear the track. The siding and parallel line merge into one and we're back to single track running again. Then we pass onto the bridge carrying the main road from Douglas to the southwest. As we quickly pick up speed, the fireman checks the fire while the driver monitors boiler pressure. Both are a vital part of running these locomotives, and while water is normally replenished at the end of each journey, there are facilities along the way for use in the case of urgency. You may have seen the water tower on the left side of the track at the beginning of the platform at Santon. We begin another turn of close to 90 degrees to resume heading southwest, and there are three points of interest in fairly quick succession. To our left shortly in the valley and out of sight is the famous fairy bridge. Fairies are an important part of Manx folklore and will be tired any drivers who cross the bridge without bidding them good day. Now, whether you believe in fairies or not is entirely up to you. But the Manx will advise you that it might be safest to add a small gift to the collection of trinkets which adorn the bridge just to be on the safe side. The second notable point is almost upon us now. It's the first controlled level crossing on our journey. Today, like nearly all crossings on the line, it's automatically controlled, and we give a warning toot on the whistle as we approach to make sure everyone knows we're coming. On the right-hand side is the old crossing keeper's hut, a lasting memorial to the days when people were involved in the process. But we're not done with level crossings just yet. The next one at Balastrang is surrounded in controversy. You'll see a man in a high visibility jacket on the right hand side of the train as we pass through. He is the sole remaining crossing keeper on the line. 
It said that the local farmer refused to allow the railway to install automatic barriers here. So the man in the dayglow vest spends his summers opening and closing the gates to allow trains to pass. Loch is now steaming along at a good pace. We've left the most difficult terrain behind us. And whilst we're still about 200 feet above sea level, we'll shortly begin a long descent. By the time we reach our next stop at Balasala, we'll be down to under 100 feet, and we'll stay there until our destination at Port Erin. Loch is on minimal power as we start to descend, and the driver is using the brakes now and again to keep our speed under control. We pass under the main road from Douglas to the southwest, which has been a constant companion on the journey, and we'll meet it again at the Balasala level crossing immediately after the station. The name Balasala comes from the Manx for Place of the Willows. It's the home to Russian Abbey, a Cistercian monastery originally built in the 12th century for the Savignac order of monks from Furness Abbey. Today it's looked after by Manx National Heritage and is part of the story of man, with artifacts discovered at the Abbey and from the surrounding area on display in a special exhibition. We are now descending more rapidly and we'll see our driver resorting again to the brakes to keep our speed in check. As the line straightens out after the long curve, you might notice something sticking up from a slight hill on the horizon to the left. This is the approach control radar dish for Ronaldsway Airport between Balasala and Castletown. The airport provides connections with the UK and Ireland, and we'll get a close-up view of one of its arrivals when we pass by the end of the runway approaching Castletown. The next level crossing is approaching around the bend. You'll see the white light on the left side indicating the barriers are down across the road. And on the right is the now disused gatekeeper's house. The automatic crossing gates control traffic on a farm track, but this spot was once the domain of Black Current Jack. His job was to open and close the gates for the trains, but in between times he would wander up and down the line collecting blackberries for jam making. We're now beginning to slow for the approach to Balasala station, and the first houses in the village are coming into sight. On the horizon are the hills to the north of our destination at Port Erin, but around us is evidence of the fertile nature of the farmland on this part of the island. A document from 1794 written by Basil Quayle, who farmed close by, shows that most farms were small, with few of more than 200 acres. Farmer Quayle reports that barley, potatoes and oats were the most profitable edible crops of the time, and most farms grew flax for use in the linen trade. We're now entering the village and Balasala station is almost in sight. Just before we reach our next stop, we cross the Mill Road level crossing, another which was automated in 2002. Just beyond it is one of the old semaphore signals you'll see along the line. These are largely disused now, but add character and style to the Victorian feel of the railway. The driver prepares to hand over the token on arrival at Balasala. There is only one token for each single track section of a railway line, and trains are forbidden to enter a stretch without it. As he brakes for the station ahead, 
He knows that the Port Heron to Douglas train will be waiting at the platform and he'll need to hand over the token to give the other driver permission to continue. We swing left onto the southbound platform and the opposing train comes into sight. You'll notice the engine is reversing from Port Heron to Douglas. There are no facilities at either end for turning locomotives around. Standing on the track is the driver of the other train, ready to carry out the swap of tokens. Once it's complete, both trains are free to proceed. But first, there are passengers to collect, and for one little girl, the opportunity to do what everyone loves to do, wave at the train. <laughs> 